thanks everyone who's joined us already. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes to get logged in and um, we'll get started shortly. Huh, Bancroft poor, how are you? Um, sorry, the attendees can't um, speak at the oh, moment. No, no. Yeah, so if you um, have any questions for us at this time, you can use the chat function or enter in the Q&A. Um, and then after the presentation's underway, um, we can promote everyone to panelists to allow for more of a um, free flowing. Question. One of my one of my longtime customers is on the on the webinar. So yeah. So I guess um, I, I I kind of had expected this to be sort of a back and forth. Uh, I didn't appreciate that this was just a one way presentation. So the stuff I have on climate change was more on a more a conversational thing. I can um, promote everyone to panelists and then they would be able to um, unmute themselves. But I certainly am prepared with lots of slides about the solar side of things. Um, and when it comes down to it, uh, everyone's probably nodding their head, but you know, climate change has been in the news so much lately that it's hard not to know what's going on. And I'm not sure I can add to, uh, add to uh, uh, what we all know what we've all been seeing in the press and <clears throat> that's right but oddly enough or maybe not oddly enough it is affecting my business but not necessarily in the way you would expect that's right mark i have a couple of slides for global warming and climate. yeah i have some slides yes. but there, there's they were really uh, I set them up, Bijan, from the when we presented last time together, where we were in a crowd, and I just uh, just assumed it was a back and forth kind of dialogue. Right. I didn't appreciate that this would be more one way. So. Yeah, that's the new reality now. Zoom meetings. Well, you know, we we my my office since the pandemic, we started having all our meetings. I mean, we we we're rarely in the office now, but we all meet remotely. Um, our sales force meets every Monday morning and there's like eight or nine of us in the, in the call. And actually we can all talk, you know, it's, it's, and we can see each other's faces. And I mean, it's not like being there, but it's not bad. And would you, then, uh, would you both like me to promote everyone so you can see them if they choose to share themselves that we I don't guess. have too big of an audience tonight. So I think it would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. One moment and then we can get started. Sometimes the remote meetings are better in that, hey, look, I want to show you this spreadsheet and then you can pull it up and everybody can see what you're doing on the spreadsheet. That's right. Here they come. Uh, 
I did read an article that said that with your video off in Zoom, it dramatically reduces your carbon footprint. I also read that article. You, know, you saw that too, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not making it up. You heard that. Right? Yes. Save <laughs> the planet I, and sorry? turn your camera off. Save the planet by turning your camera off? Yeah, yeah. I wish that's all it took. Yeah. I have I to add I've, that to my list. Um, given given almost everyone the option to accept. Um, yes, so you can accept being a panelist if you want to be able to unmute yourself or share your camera um, to feel like we're more in person together. Thank you, Stella. Um, we just ask that if you do promote yourself, um, accept the promotion to panelists that you remain on mute unless you have a question um, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers while they're um, pre uh, presenting. Um, and then you can also um, raise your use the raise hand function if you have a question and you don't want to be a panelist um, and I can um, unmute you by that way or you can use the Q&A function if you don't want to use your camera or microphone this evening. Um, and so those are just some ground rules for this evening. A reminder, um, this is being recorded. So if you wanna view it at a later date, you will be able to, you can also share it with um, neighbors that were not able to, to attend tonight. And um, there is a live transcript. So you should be able to read um, what we are speaking about uh, as we go as well. Um, and if so, did we take? Yeah, so if I've um, promoted you to panelists, whatever notification you get, you can accept that. Um, and then I can demote you if you if you would like to be demoted. Um, Thanks, that worked. Okay. Yep, okay. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to our speakers tonight and then I'll pass over um, the virtual mic to them so they can um, share their presentation. So. Um, tonight, we have with us Mark Durenberger, who started installing renewable energy systems in 2006, and Bijan Horsaviani with A9 Green, a Lexington resident, um, that started improving home efficiency in 2009. And why they do this? Well, it turns out that energy use of buildings and homes is a major component of climate change. So tonight, Mark will be covering climate change, a bit about what's happening, which, as he mentioned, I'm sure many of us are already aware of, and how buildings can play a role in helping that. Um, he'll talk also about solar energy and how it works and the benefits that serves for climate change, as well as the financial aspects of solar for residential and commercial installations. Then we'll pass it over to Bijan, who will be discussing some of the building science around these ideas and what that means, as well as energy efficiency and what it means for the economics, the comfort, and our climate, as well as some common ways to get a more efficient home and or office um, right here in Lexington. So with that, I am pleased to pass it over to um, Mark, who I believe will be speaking first. Tonight. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, hope you're all having a good evening. Hope you had supper. If not, and you're eating now, keep eating. That's cool too. Um, I will start up a little PowerPoint here. And then I will, oh, of course it hides um, my screen here, bear with. Now I can share screen. And I'm not sure which one it wants. I guess it's that one. Yes, okay. Um, Thank you, Stella. Appreciate the introduction. Yes, uh, I've been doing solar a long time. Uh, I started the solar stuff about the same time I went to Nashville uh, to be trained, me and about 2,000 of Al Gore's best friends to be trained in climate change. And I was doing his Inconvenient Truth presentation in 2006, 2007. And I presented to a couple of thousand people, you know, including a bunch of kids at school. Um, the best story that I have to tell about that was I went to the middle school here in Hudson. I presented the Inconvenient Truth. I had to cut it back a little bit because it was a little bit long. 
And, um, you know, great questions. The kids were really attentive. And then a couple of years later, I was at the high school and uh, one of my kids was there and it was about a trip to Germany. And one of the kids comes up to me and says, Mr. Durenberger, did you do that presentation on climate change at, at, at the middle school? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, that was awesome. And then the dad looks at me and goes, he's driving us crazy about this. <laughs> so I guess I had a positive impact on the son, maybe not so good on dad, but anyways. Um, as I said, when we were starting, uh, I don't know that there's much I can add to what we know about climate change. Um, perhaps the, the, the thing that I, I, I mean, one of the things that was in uh, Mr. Gore's presentation way back when was a thing about the Gulf Stream. And scientists at the time were theorizing that with all the fresh water dumping into the uh, North Atlantic from Greenland melting, that it could affect the Gulf Stream. That was in 2006. And now we've got data this year suggesting that the Gulf Stream is slowing down. And I can't imagine the kind of things that that um, uh, w will mean, you know, how it will change Europe, how it will change uh, the Northeast. Uh, I mean, I just, I mean, it's, it, it, it's serious stuff. And uh, I mean, a part of me doesn't even want to imagine. Uh, so that's just one data point that, uh, you know, people knew about, you know, more than a decade ago. I had a video, I don't think I'm gonna show it. Um, I guess I open it up to questions and if I don't know the answer, I bet somebody else online does know the answer. Um, as far as, you know, what, have you, what questions do you have about climate change? And Stella, are you watching the, uh, the question board there? Yes, I'm watching and I also realized that in the introductions, I failed to introduce myself. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Stella Carr, the sustainability director for the town. So thanks for being okay. here. Okay. And if there are no pressing questions or you all know what I know, then let me just move on. Um, you know, average temperatures, yes, they continue to rise. Um, there's a funny little video. Again, I'm not going to I'm not going to waste time with that. Um, this was a Boston Globe article back from 2019 about Cape Cod losing three feet of shoreline a year. Any of you that have houses on the Cape, I hope you're protected or maybe you've sold by now. I don't know. Um, something to keep in mind. Um, uh, but oceans are getting higher, right? Greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being the one we all know and love. Um, but there are other methane is a nasty greenhouse gas and they just serve as a blanket. They let hot in, but they don't let anything out. And so our planet's getting warmer. And uh, this is our greenhouse gas concentrations going back since uh, 1980. Uh, and it cycles like that because uh, the, um, there's less foliage in the Southern hemisphere. And during their growing season, the foliage doesn't suck up as much carbon dioxide as during our growing season in the Northern hemisphere. So you see this cycling from over the course of a year in the CO2 concentrations. Fossil fuel consumption, we're still going up. Um, I don't look so much as the, at the world numbers. Uh, I, I do look at the, um, the local numbers and about 80% of New England's electricity is fossil fuel generated. Most of it is natural gas. Um, so maybe not as bad as coal, but still, still uh, a carbon emitting source. And uh, the Upton Sinclair quote, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And if you've been following any of our uh, West Virginia senators um, conversations and how he wants to take a middle road thing to, um, to these uh, infrastructure bill, and then you find out he gets uh, half a million dollars a year from the coal industry. Uh, he, has a, he, has, he has a financial interest in that. And you gotta wonder whether he's, his, his middle road on infrastructure is really to preserve his revenue stream. Um, one thing to remember is that humans are really good with emergencies, but this emergency would probably be best described as a long emergency. So it's more, the analogy is more like that frog in the, in the warm water and then you're slowly turning it up and because the frog is cold blooded, they uh, don't respond and they uh, sit in the water till they cook. Um, and if you ever want to be scared, I recommend reading The Long Emergency by James Howard Kunstler. It's a, it's a good read, but it, it, it opens your eyes to a lot of things. Um, what can we do? Obviously, uh, 
a lot of us are taking our doing our part you know we're driving better cars we're putting in solar systems we're trying to reduce our carbon footprints uh as Bijan and i will both tell you a lot of people are trying to make their homes more energy efficient there's a lot of big industry though that needs a uh, kick in the butt or as h ross perot used to say a poke with a sharp stick um and uh you know fossil fuel industries for example need to uh need to figure out how to start doing things differently or not doing it at all um on a personal level yeah lower your energy usage uh renewable energy electric cars i bet i bet a half a dozen of you've already gone electric um and uh it, it, it's i mean i i haven't yet I, my car still has a few more years left in it and i think about the embodied energy so i don't want to just get another car because there's a whole bunch of energy that went into making that car and it's not used up yet so but i will i will um you know I, i'm gonna i could go into um uh the details but my wife and i have done a pretty good job of knocking our energy usage down i've done a lot of insulation without the advice of Bijan. Uh, I probably could have gotten some input from him to improve what I was doing, but I have dramatically reduced our usage for our house. The other way you can reduce your energy usage is have more people in your house, because then your per capita energy usage goes down. But, you know, that may be counter. <laughs> you don't want your kids moving back in. I get that. Um, what about solar? Okay, so solar has uh, has a couple of benefits. Of course, by generating solar electricity, you're it's clean. It's not coming from a fossil fuel. And so it reduces your carbon footprint. Um, but there's also the, the, the cost savings associated with it. This is the residential rate trend for electricity in Massachusetts. Uh, this is largely the investor owned utility. So Eversource National Grid Unitil. The municipals have a slower growth rate in electricity prices. But uh, Lexington being an Eversource town, you know, you can expect about a 4% a year increase. However, uh, just two days ago, I saw a filing by National Grid and their basic service is gonna go up by three to five cents a kilowatt hour. That's what they've requested. So that would be a way more than a 4% increase on the total rate. That's, that's a really dramatic increase. And why are they doing this? Natural gas prices are going up and uh, they're trying to hedge. So they anticipate that, but you know, six months from now, natural gas is going to be really expensive. Um, when I'm asked why people go solar, when I started this business 15 years ago, it was the vast majority of people were doing solar for environmental reasons, and they were financially quite comfortable, right? No one who was, you know, I mean, even a moderate income person wouldn't do solar. And I'll show you the numbers in a minute as to why. Um, nowadays, people go solar for both reasons, financial and environmental. And when push comes to shove, more will say they're doing it for the financial reasons than for the environmental reasons. And then there's always those people that like, I'm going to stick it to National Grid or Eversource or whoever, right? Sticking it to the man, as they say, right? Now, why has that changed from being the, the, the wealthy environmentalist to the everyday guy? Um, this is the amazing part of what's happened in solar. My, I started my business in 06, but I did solar hot water and the first system I did there were solar hot water systems. And I did my first PV system, photovoltaics, in 2007. And that was 12 panels. They were 200 watt uh, Sanyos at the time, who's no longer around. I got bought by Panasonic. Um, so 2,400 watts with a central inverter uh, made here in Massachusetts at the time. And that was $24,000. It was $10 a watt. Think of it that way. If you're going to compare solar systems, oftentimes you'll you'll normalize it down to the per watt price. Today, 2,400 watt panels. Now the output is double, but the physical size is not double. So, but it is bigger. The new panels are bigger, but they're not twice as big. So I get 8,000 watts. I've got a per panel inverter, which is tends to be a little bit more expensive than your than your single inverter. And it's twenty nine thousand dollars, or about three sixty a watt, eh, maybe three twenty a watt, depending on the roof. A steep roof can cost a little more than a shallow roof because they're harder to install. But over the fourteen years, that's a sixty four percent reduction in cost. Amazing, right? For the but for the first time in my in fourteen years of doing photovoltaics, we are seeing an across the board price increase. Panels. Inverters, racking, wiring, and labor. Everything went up this year. It's the first time it's ever happened. Part of that is supply issues. 
Part of that is COVID issues. Part of that is, I don't know. I don't know, but we've consistently, everything has gone up in price. It's really hard actually, because we were always used to an industry where our prices were dropping. So I could bid something and win the bid and the price would go down between the time I sold it and the time I'd install it. And we'd make a little extra, but not anymore. Um, how does it work? It's really simple. You put solar panels up on the roof or on a ground mount, typically on the roof. Um, and then uh, as of late, we are doing one inverter per panel. The inverter is a device that converts the DC over to the AC. There are different configurations. We've done them all. We've currently settled on the microinverter solution. The power from the inverter system goes through a meter of some sort. It may not be look like this, but it'll be a meter of some sort to measure production. You'll be able to connect online and see how these inverters are performing and how each panel is doing. And then the output from that system feeds to the breaker panel or sometimes to the cable between the breaker panel and the meter, depends on the site. When you are using the electricity, if you're running your dishes or, or watching TV or sitting in a webinar, you're using electricity, that's where the electricity goes. And if you're not using the electricity, it goes back through this meter and then that meter runs backwards. So the, uh, the common term for this is um, net metering. Oh, I got the slides out of order here. Yeah, that's the slide I want. Um, in the investor owned utilities, that's Eversource National Grid and Unitil, if you're using electricity you make, your utility meter runs slower or it stops. And if your system is making electricity you don't use, your meter runs backwards and you earn a dollar credit equal to what you would normally pay for that kilowatt hour, all right? And there's some exceptions. As systems get bigger, the rules change and I'm not gonna go into those. And then those credits carry forward on your bill until you use them. And I have some people that generate enough credits in the spring that they cover their whole usage in the summer. Um, and then some people that just have enough credits to get to the next day, right? If you live in a town with a municipal utility, every muni is different. So the rules don't, aren't the same. Um, the other thing that uh, is happening, and this was the slide I had out of order, uh, is that we're getting a lot of calls for battery systems. And this is where climate change has played a role in my business. In the first 12 years I was in business, I sold two battery systems. One of them was on an island. So the guy didn't really have a choice or he didn't want to pay the utility the crazy rates to get power out to his island, okay? The other one was in a regular residential setting and his reason was he didn't like generators, so. But in the last three years, I've sold about 50 battery systems and most of those have come in the last year. And the primary reasons, we had the Texas winter where they had not winterized their grid and it froze. They had issues where they couldn't even shovel coal because the coal was iced over and they didn't have the equipment they could dig into the coal piles with. Um, and then in California, they had the wildfires and the utilities in order to prevent more wildfires were actually blacking out. The reason they were doing that was to keep equipment from overheating and sparking and causing more wildfires. And that's largely because they weren't doing the appropriate preventive maintenance or system upgrades, which you know for-profit corporations are sometimes guilty of in order to prevent, protect their profits, right? And then of course, we've had some pretty devastating hurricanes come through and all of that um, has added up to people thinking, gee, I'm not so sure the grid is all that stable. Um, we happen to be a Generac dealer. We like them a lot for a bunch of reasons. And I even put some costs in here. If, you, if you're at all interested in batteries, I can talk to you offline about that. Um, this, is the, uh, that's, this is the wiring for how a battery works. Basically, the inverter sends the power to the house normally through normal paths out to the street if it goes to the street. And then when power goes out, you have a transfer switch that isolates the house from the street. And instead of having the power follow this green path, it follows the red path and comes back into the house that way. So. Uh, so climate change has in fact affected our business. Uh, we're selling as much solar as we ever sold, but now we're selling batteries to go with them. Okay. Um, I covered net metering already. This is what a typical system looks like. You know, this is 27 panels. These are 335. So this was probably done about a year and a half ago. Um, but at night at 10,800 kilowatt hours a year, um, this is probably zeroing out this home's electric bill are pretty close. Up on the roof, 
Um, the racking, it shows silver rails, but actually all of our racking is black now. I don't have any modern, most recent pictures. And then you have your microinverters wired onto the rails or attached to the rails. And then each panel has got its own connection to a microinverter and all the microinverters are stringed together in series. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we do small roofs. I haven't done one this small in a long time, but that's eight panels back in Jamaica Plain a long time ago. And then we do large roofs. You know, this is uh, 11,000 watts. It's a pretty good sized system in the Hudson Light and Power Territory. This is another uh, modest size thing, system. Generally, we can cover the roof, but we're running up against new fire codes that want us to do setbacks. So it depends on the town. We have to check with every town and sometimes there's setbacks. I don't believe Lexington has any of those requirements. And then when we don't have roof or, or the roof faces the wrong way, here's the customer's roof. The front of the house is east, the back of the house is west. It's okay. Uh, he says, I got a big field in the background, so backyard. So we did a ground mount, that's what it is up close. And that's what it looks like from the satellite. Uh, those panels are pretty much due south and they're tilted at the ideal angle. There, and there's very little shade. He gets, some, he gets some shade very early in the morning from the trees over here almost no shade in the afternoon. And so these panels just crank. So it's a really good site. That's the beauty. Now a ground mount might cost more than a roof mount, but its performance is almost always better than a roof mount for the same site. Um, funky roofs, multiple pitches, no problem with the technology we have now. Um, uh, multiple pitches and multiple azimuths and a mix of solar hot water on that roof. And if you've got a big flat commercial roof, we typically tilt the panels at about five degrees and then they're held in place with ballast block. We try not to make it very many holes in the roof. Um, and then the five degrees is a trade off. If I were to tilt it to the ideal angle, which is about 40 degrees, then I would create huge sails on the roof and I would need more ballast block than that roof can handle. So we go, we, get, we compromise, put the panels at five degrees. There's also baffles on the back to keep the wind from lifting them, but it allows us to get away with much less ballast to keep these things from blowing off the roof. Um, okay, let's see. And then this particular system, I had a, a wall of inverters. In this job, we actually use string inverters instead of micro inverters, which uh, efficiency wise and cost wise makes a lot of sense when you're doing bigger systems. When I do a site assessment, I look at the roof, angle, azimuth, area, age, the structure underneath, and how much shade it's get, getting. When I'm on a ground mount, it's what am I dealing with for soil? Is it ledge or is it just dirt? And then how long a trench and shade, right? And then I also look at electric service, 100, 200 amps. What do you have for open breaker slots, that sort of thing. A lot of this stuff we can do remotely now. I use a tool called Aurora that allows me to uh, assess a roof, draw a design. I can even assess roof pitch because they do what's something called LIDAR, uh, laser-based radar. Um, and so most sites now are captured in high-res images that we can just draw the roofs on and do the design. Um, the hard part is new homes because they, they don't show up in the satellite data yet. Um, as far as the finances go, we have a federal tax credit of 26%. So it's 26% of what you spend reduces your taxes. And that's everything, that's installation and equipment and all that. There's also a $1,000 Massachusetts tax credit. If you're a commercial entity, you can accelerate the depreciation to about five years. Um, and of course you can only take the tax benefits if you pay taxes. So nonprofit organizations either have to pay the whole thing or they can do something called a power purchase agreement where they don't actually own the system, but they buy the solar power, the solar energy at a discount compared to what they would pay their utility. Some nonprofits have the funds to pay for systems, others don't. And so the power purchase agreement works great for those folks. Um, the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target, it's the SMART program. Uh, frankly, I would describe this title as Orwellian. Some of you are laughing, you get it. Um, yeah, it's a really hard program to administer. It's not been well done from our experience and it's almost gone, which is kind of the sad part about it. Um, but when you make a kilowatt hour of electricity, you get electricity and you get credit that you made a solar kilowatt hour. And the electricity of course saves you money. That credit uh, is basically paid to you in the form of a smart incentive 
Uh, and once those payments start, it's a 10 year program. Unfortunately, the SMART program is gone. They've used up all the, the, the allocation in that Unitel and National Grid. Everstore still has some allocation and they're paying at about six to six and a half cents per kilowatt hour, in addition to anything you save on your electric bill. It's paid for by the utility. They issue a 1099, so the income is taxable. Um, from, a, from a financial standpoint, um, I just did a fairly standard 20 panel system at Lexington electric rates on a decent roof, not a great roof, not a bad roof. And we're seeing when you factor in the tax credits, the smart, um, the smart income here, the tax credit here, uh, this is about a $29,000 system. It'll pay for itself in about seven years, which is still pretty good, still pretty good. Um, the average person, homeowner lives in their home for 13 years, so it'll pay for itself twice. Well, maybe not twice because the tax credit is only once. Um, what affects costs? The number one variable is system size, how many panels, right? And then roof ground, roof systems tend to be less expensive than ground, mic, ground systems. And then panel makers, um, LG, Sun Power is probably the most expensive panel. LG is up there. Uh, and then you have the sort of Me Too products that are, you know, uh, uh, Hanwha and uh, Yingli, and oh, there's a dozen of them out there that uh, all make a panel that's very similar. They all try to differentiate, but largely they're all about the same. Some have better warranties than others, and that's how we, you know, will uh, a customer may decide, yeah, I want that with the 25 year labor warranty versus no labor warranty or whatever. And of course, you get tax credits and rebates uh, in some utilities, and municipals have some rebates. And then the smart credits, um, depending on where you live, uh, might still be available. Um, and then there's my contact information. So that's it on the solar side. Um, I, are we going to do questions at the end, Stella? Uh, we can pause for a few minutes and field some questions based on what you've discussed so far. Okay. So if anyone has questions, feel free to- How do I open the chat window? I'm gonna turn off the PowerPoint here. Stop, so I'll stop presenting. Eh. What happened to Zoom? There you are. There we go. Okay. You can- um, and mute yourself or put yourself a question in the chat or um, use the raise hand function. And if um, we'll pause for a moment and if there's no questions, we can continue and save them for the end. Um, there was one in the chat. I don't know if you were able to see it, Mark, um, during your presentation. I can just uh, speak it, shall I? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I was, I was uh... Mark, I, I was wondering about, I've, I've read quite a bit about forests and carbon sequestration and trying to compare the value of that to solar panels. Ah, good and, question. And I, I, I've come to the conclusion, uh, well, actually there's a number of issues with forests. I'm, I'm not wild about harvesting because of the problem of opening it up to invasives and other issues. But anyway, on, on, the, on the environmental, strict environmental side, I really think that cutting down forest for solar panels is a really bad idea. I, you and, know, I, I actually concur. <laughs> yeah. um, but and apparently in the state, I, I, came, I came across a map where you could click on solar sites and it would say what it was before a solar site and almost all of them said forest. Yeah, no, so, um, so the yeah. numbers are really clear that the carbon offset of solar is higher than the carbon offset of the equivalent forest space. However, the frustrating thing from my perspective is there are still a lot of roofs that could be taken advantage of. But the way the solar incentives were developed, and I'll have to say that I think the, the solar farm industry got their fingers into it and really helped the incentive be great for them and not as good as it should have been for rooftop solar. And that drove that behavior. Now, the other thing too is land and, and where, the, where the large majority of these solar farms are going in is out you know, Western Mass or Central Mass. But unfortunately, the loads aren't there. Right. So now there's all sorts of issues about how do they pipe it, pipe, wire it to get those, get that power to where the loads are. Now, if you look at Eversource territory, it's pretty densely populated. So there aren't a whole lot of places to put solar farms in Eversource territory 
compared to say national grid territory or western mass ever right. source and i think that the way the incentive structure was built was completely tilted towards ground mounted solar farms uh, the evidence i have to this is when they opened up the incentive the smart incentive in national grid there were eight blocks of incentives and it we're in block six or seven in the resident and we're in block eight now in, in national grid we're still in block five in, in eversource all eight blocks of national grid were used up in two weeks and Mark, that's Mark, all can, central and western mass or central mass can i ask you can i ask you to clarify one thing and that is when you when you talked about the forest and solar uh, I feel the term you used, whether it was a sequestration or, or whatever the, the environmental benefit was, you said solar was better? Yeah, carbon offset from solar Car is- Okay, but offset, what do you mean by the offset? The meaning that, that if I generate a kilowatt hour with, with a solar panel versus a kilowatt hour with natural gas, yeah. you know, that obviously I'm not putting any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere right. with a okay. solar panel. So I'm reducing the carbon footprint by offsetting natural gas generation with my solar, and that's actually more beneficial than uh, than what the tree, the rate at which the trees absorb carbon dioxide. Okay. And does I that have an article it? on that. If you go to my website, there's an article called Tree Math. Tree Math, I yeah. I, I compare I love that. the carbon be benefit of solar versus the carbon benefit of trees. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so obviously that must take into account, uh, you know, trees don't need any manufacturing materials. Yeah, no, I mean, I, obviously there's, if we want to drill down into it, you're right. There's, there's a footprint associated with assembling the panels. The good news is that most panels offset their carbon footprint in about two years. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, there's thank a, you. Um, another question that came in the chat um, asking if you install on wood shingle and because most places don't and um, I have not done a wood shingle roof and I'm really <laughs> and then can you make a backup battery system only meaning without solar I think that's what they yes mean. actually um, uh, uh, our generac product will work without um, without solar um, the utilities might not like that but too bad for them right because one of the things that they, so the utility has a great incentive program for batteries. If your battery is charged with a solar system and they use your battery during peak events. So let's say it was like July 4th or 3rd, it was super hot. And they expected, po you know, three, four in the afternoon that air conditioning was all gonna go on and the load goes up. And so what they do is they, they start asking businesses to dial back their usage they take over so if you have, if you have your thermostat enrolled they take over your thermostat and you know they turn up your air conditioning before the peak event and they turn off your air conditioning during the peak event but they'll also take the the kilowatts that your battery can produce and they basically put your battery into export mode and then they pay you to do that so our standard battery will generate about nine thousand dollars worth of income for every source and national grid customers over the first five years um, but the condition is that the battery has to be charged with the solar. Well, why is that? Well, if everybody had a battery and started charging it, then that might create a new peak and they're worried about peak demands and uh, the cost of electricity goes up on peak. And I'm not sure our systems can handle the full peak. And uh, that's something they don't talk about, but um, my, uh, call it my two cents is Texas suffered from a grid that wasn't winterized. I think that New England could very well suffer from a grid that hasn't been summarized, meaning that every air conditioner is running because it's so hot and the grid can't handle all that load. And so the utilities are doing everything they can to reduce load. And one of the ways to do that is to use your battery and pay you for it, but it's cheaper to pay you than to buy the peak power from some of the gas turbine generators. Thank you. And then I see that Cindy, you had your hand up. I'm not sure if you put it down or if um, you still had a question. Yeah. Hi. No, I just, um, uh, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to follow up and I started uh, putting it in the chat, but this question from um, Alan about uh, what's better solar versus trees. I just wanted to mention for people who didn't know, there's a professor Bill Muma from Tufts University. He was on IPCC panels. I see Alan uh, <laughs> nodding his head. He's got a lot of explanations about why it's better to keep, you know, these forests intact. 
um, a couple of reasons that the, the calculations, um, you know, of the area of the solar panel versus that tree area, it doesn't, it doesn't include everything else that you have to cut, the road you have to cut, the area around you have to, around the solar panels that you have to cut. Um, it doesn't include the, the um, I forget the term, but there's more sort of sequestration capabilities in the trees that it's not using. Um, he's actually, I think she said he's, they're working on um, a paper to bring it out, but I just, I, I, and Stella, you had actually said this before in your chat um, answer that, 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 that it's not, it's not um, sort of clear cut, <laughs> as you said, and, uh, and uh, I think that uh, that work that Professor Mugan has done is really, um, I think, very uh, important and useful. That's it. Thank say you. His, can you say his name again, please? Yeah, his last name is Muma, M-O-O-M-A-W. Um, he's at Tufts University, Okay. but has been on um, IPCC panels. All right. Um, that's, and, that's good. I mean, as I said, I, I am not a solar farm fan. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, typically when I have a conversation about trees, it's not about acres. It's about these two trees that are overhanging my house, you know, that kind of a thing, right? So, so generally in that scenario, it's a win to do solar. Um, and I'm not an expert on solar farms. And so I would like to read Mr. Muma's uh, um, analysis. Yeah, Bill Muma is an advocate for what I think what he calls afforestation, um, which is basically protecting all forests. And so he's also even against uh, quite a bit of, uh, not, not all wood harvesting, but in many areas, he really is against wood harvesting. Um, so he's, he's, he's sort of a, got a, taken a fairly uh, extreme stance, although I think, um, okay. I think it's a rational one though. No, no, it sounds rational. Now, I, I, I am, uh, as I said, there are far too many roofs that have not been taken advantage of that could have been, that could be. We have acres and acres and acres of roofs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of that is, you know, it's just going to, there's the financial limits of the people that want to put it on, and that probably could be addressed through various tax credits. You know, our tax credit's down 26%, used to be 30, it went down, uh, it was supposed to go down again, but they at least stayed that off for a couple of years. Um, but uh, when you think about um, the, the, the alternatives, <laughs> it, it seems like a cheap, cheap thing to do. Uh, the other thing too is, in the beginning, when I was doing solar, I would only look at roofs that were pretty much due south and had close to the ideal angle. We just didn't bother because, you know, it was 17, 19 years, 20 years to pay for itself. Nowadays, almost any roof. I mean, clearly roofs that are in full shade, we're not going to do. But even roofs that have northeast or northwest faces, if they're low pitch, can work. So much, and the numbers aren't break the bank. It's, it's amazing. You know, it used to be, we used to say, oh, there's only 25% of the roofs that are even qualified. That's no longer true. And it has to do with the fact that the cost of systems have come down so much. So it, then what do we run into? Let's see, too many people in the neighborhood get solar, too many, no such thing. And there's only one transformer serving the neighborhood. And the utility rule says you can't put more, if the transformer is rated at 25 kilowatts, you can't put more than 25 kilowatts of solar behind that transformer. And right now, the person that pushes you over 25 gets hit with the bill for that new transformer. Oh, it's $8,000. So your solar system was 29, but here's another eight to upgrade the transformer that we all use, right? Uh, there are some work in progress to try to break that, to try to get you know, a, a more reasonable way to distribute that cost and, and take that barrier away. There's another barrier that uh, one of our listeners knows really well, Bancroft is online, and that is when you go above 10 kilowatts, on a residential 240 volt system, your electricity export value drops from 24 cents a kilowatt hour to three cents a kilowatt hour. Or in Eversource, it might be 13 cents because they still have net metering cap. Wonky stuff, I know, but um, as houses try to add electric cars and electric cooling and heating, they're gonna run into this 10 kilowatt limit on a regular basis. They need more solar, but the excess solar, the value of the excess solar is way lower than if they do a smaller system. So that's another economic barrier imposed by the utilities. We have tried to change this for more than a decade and can't seem to get any progress. Um, 
the excess solar is, if, is solar that they, they've generated more than they can use. Yeah, and the way they do it now is they resolve at the end of the billing cycle. So if you right. used 1,000 kilowatt hours, but you generated 1,200, mm -hmm. if your system's under 10 kilowatts, those extra two kilowatt, 200 kilowatt hours are worth 25 cents each. If your system's over 10 kilowatts, then those extra kilowatt hours are worth 13 cents each in, in Eversource, and they're worth three cents in National Grid. So. If you use it all up, it's not so bad. That's right. That's right. But it's really hard to design a system that works that way because we have a very big swing over the seasons. You know, your winter output is quite a bit lower than your summer output. And so you can have excess generation in months, right. like typically in the spring, we see that. And people want to carry that excess generation forward. Well, with the net reading metering rules, the way they're written right now, systems above 10 kilowatts don't get to carry anything forward. They just get paid the three cents or the 13 cents. Someone had a question uh, somewhat related to that, asking if the rain, uh, record rainfall this summer had any effects on solar production. You know, that's a good question. I haven't looked yet. Um, I typically will pull a bunch of systems out of our uh, online portals and I'll look at the numbers and, uh, and see if we have any noticeable production uh, uh, deltas. But I, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we had, but uh, I don't know. All right, I think there's a couple more questions in the chat, but I maybe we'll hold on those and we'll um, pass over to Bijan and then we can revisit questions related to both presenters uh, at the end. All right, thank you. Uh, Stella, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, everybody can see my screen, okay? All right, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, small group. I'm um, going, uh, well, I had an agenda for myself, but we're gonna go uh, through this much faster because it looks like uh, many people here are very knowledgeable already about the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So I'm just going to just touch them. Uh, I tell you, I start with uh, giving you a little bit of background about ourselves and uh, what we do here. And then a couple of slides about climate change and a little bit about the building science and what, uh, home energy rating or HERS rating is about, if you, some of you may not know uh, of it. Uh, and what, a couple of things that we can do uh, in our uh, own uh, small way uh, to help the ourselves and environment. And finally, I'll wrap it up like um, Mark did with the incentives and benefits that are out there uh, for us in Massachusetts. So uh, we started this uh, in 2009. Uh, we do projects more than in more than 95 towns and cities in Massachusetts, um, single family, multifamily, low rise, high rise. Um, we do uh, uh, energy, bulk of our business is energy efficiency, consulting, energy modeling, earth rating, lead, passive house, verification rating. And also we uh, recently started another division of our business, which we do aero barriers uh, ceiling, or we call it ABS. If you may have heard about this new technology, I can talk about it a little bit. These are some of the tools and work that we do, um, you know, infrared thermography, blower door testing, duct leakage testing, combustion analyzer, you know, and this is the, uh, at one of the sites that we do uh, aero barrier um, uh, air ceiling of the home. On the side, we do some 3D rendering animation work and also 3D printing house, et cetera, for some historical uh, regions. By the way, I'm passing quickly, as I said, through these slides. If you, at any time, if you have questions, we can always go back to this slide and I can give you more information uh, if you're interested. So uh, in air barrier ceiling that I said is a new technology, uh, just to say it in a few words, uh, it's basically we create a, we pressurize first the building to 100 Pascal and we create a fog with a totally environmentally friendly material, which is water-based. And actually uh, they use it in um, hospitals and daycares and health cares. And with that fog inside the building, while the building is pressurized, it goes and super air seals the home. And in fact, it does a much, much better job than even isoning the spray foam 
And um, another nice thing about it is that everything is computerized and you can actually see, um, uh, you know, as the house is becoming air sealed, you can see it, how, how it works. And the result at the end is guaranteed because it's everything under control. Again, if you're interested, I have a quick uh, video um, uh, clip to show about uh, from this old house, which many of you may be familiar with it. About the climate change, how, how does it work? This is very uh, basic, which I assume I'm just gonna skip this two minutes video clip again, if anyone interested how uh, climate change, uh, why it's happening. Uh, we can talk about it, but this uh, slide, uh, I don't know, you may have seen it, but to me it's a very interesting slide from NASA, uh, which shows, uh, you know, going back a few years, uh, the exact 800,000 years. And as you see, we have had uh, picks up and down, up and down on the CO2 emission, but uh, just see what happens as we get to 1950s. We are, I cannot say it, if this is even exponential uh, growth is, is almost vertical. So, and uh, we are just going up and up and up. And um, so this is, uh, this is sad. And in the past 800,000 years, we have never been over this line, but now we are going up and up and up. Um, well, is it real? Yes, of course, it's real, it's here, it's now, and I, I, I'm just wondering why people call it climate change and not climate crisis. We should start using, as, as uh, Mark said about with his well, frog story, that is what we are really in it, and it's real. Now, going um, to checking out to see how much building is contributing to this uh, growth in CO2 emission. Um, as you see here uh, in residential and commercial building, we contribute about 40% uh, total on, on this uh, problem. And then uh, on the global sector of CO2 emission, uh, well, sorry, this was the energy consumption in US uh, you know, 40% commercial residential, and then CO2 emission global, again, about 40% of total CO2 emission is caused by buildings. Now, building science uh, is a basic thermodynamics, so uh, second law, I guess, uh, you know, how we can lose energy, basically by three means, conduction, convection, basically hot air and then radiation. And um, conduction and convection is the most of a winter issue uh, and, and radiation of course is a summer issue. When we uh, talk about our home uh, conduction, you know, any, uh, it, it depends on the, how much insulation, how good of the windows, et cetera, we have. And convection is how much air leak we have in our building or our house. And radiation, as I said, is a more matter of the summer. So also, again, depends on how well um, our windows are, the solar heat gain coefficients uh, number on our windows, and how much we use blinds, how well um, you know, we have the overhangs, et cetera, how, how well we have designed our home uh, to, um, you know, to minimize the uh, glazing on one side versus the other, et cetera. So air uh, whole house infiltration, where basically in winter time, this is the example of winter, cold air comes in through the cracks and holes in the basement, uh, warms up with, uh, with our heating system, and then goes up through the cracks and holes from the attic. Majority of it goes out from the attic, some from the windows and other places. Now, HERS rating, um, Again, I have a two minutes video, maybe I should show this. I don't know if everyone knows about what HERS rating is about, but I think maybe I'll just show this quickly. It's a couple of minutes of uh, video. Uh, Hi, I'm John Bell. I'm here to tell you how to get everything you want in a home. What's on your list of must haves? Granite countertops, fine cabinetry, high-end appliances. What about the efficiency of your home? Is that something you're looking for? I'm going to explain why it should be 
and how your home's efficiency is the key to getting all those must-haves on your list. What makes a home more efficient? Things like renewable energy systems, better mechanical equipment, and a more airtight house. Think of it like the miles per gallon rating of your car. A more efficient home gets more miles to the gallon. But how can you measure efficiency? Introducing the HERS Index, the most comprehensive home energy rating system in North America that has already been used to rate over 1.5 million new homes. Here's how it works. The HERS rating system uses a simple, easy to understand index based on a 100 point scale where the lower the score, the higher the performance. Think golf, not football. HERS not only accounts for everything inside the house, but also accounts for everything outside, including what goes up on your roof. So HERS takes into consideration plug loads, actual hot water load, air conditioning, drain water heat recovery, and renewables like solar. And energy savings are directly proportional to HERS point improvements. A 15% improved HERS score equals a 15% energy savings. So the lower your HERS score, the greater the miles per gallon you'll get from your home. And that translates directly into lower energy bills and monthly savings. Remember those granite countertops you've always wanted? Let a HERS rated home help you pay for them. And keep in mind, the efficiency rating using the HERS index ensures predictable performance of both existing and newly built rated homes. And predictable performance is something you just can't guarantee without a rating. HERS is third-party validated, so you've got nothing to worry about. ResNet Home Energy Raters are highly trained, certified, and adhere to the Mortgage Industry National Home Energy Rating Standards. And as an added bonus, certified energy rated homes have higher resale value, resulting in even more cash in your pocket when it's time to sell. Buying a HERS rated home just makes sense. And remember, the lower the score, the better. The HERS score, where less means more. All right, so, um, okay. So, yeah, so basically uh, how we do it is a four phase process. Uh, the first uh, phase is the plan review. We get a set of plans. We create a 3D model, I'll go through it, and then we do the energy modeling. And then second phase, we, we sit down with the homeowners and the builder involved and the architect. Um, and uh, we will discuss uh, anything. So basically anything that goes into a home from, uh, if you can imagine from the stud size to the type of installation, type of the window, solar heat going, coefficient U factors of the windows that make and the HVAC system, you know, heating, cooling, domestic hot water, thermostat appliances, lighting, ventilation, orientation of the building, shading on the building, anything that you can think of uh, that goes into the building is gonna be into our model. And then as uh, mentioned um, at the end, it will uh, come back with the uh, with what is called the HERS index. So in our meeting, uh, in, um, in our session uh, with our clients, we usually cover all these aspects and we give pros and cons of, uh, we give a few options in each area and we give uh, pros and cons of each option. And we let them decide which, which path they wanna take. So, and then we have midpoint inspection after the house is insulated and then prior to sheet tracking, and then at the end, which is final inspection and testing. So this is a sample of a, a 3D model that we create, and then we extract the data that we need from this model. You use another software to do the actual energy modeling. And then this is a sample of the uh, midpoint inspection after installation is done before sheet rock. And then uh, this is at the final inspection and testing. We do the blower door testing which basically we depressurize the home to minus 50 Pascal, and we measure the whole house infiltration. We'll see how, how leaky or airtight uh, the house is. And those numbers are going to go right into our, um, uh, into our energy model. Uh, same thing for using a duct blaster test to measure the uh, duct leakage of the uh, you know, duct systems uh, that we have and also the ventilation system, if they have ERV or other means of uh, automated ventilation mechanism, which is actually right now is mandatory and is required by code. Um, 
uh, now again, if you have questions, these two right here, ventilation system and duct glass or testing system, actually these two, uh, they are have a lot to do with the air quality that we are dealing with uh, in today's uh, era, in COVID era. And then uh, again, if there's question, we can talk about it more. Uh, at the end of the project, then we will produce a final certificate like this, which is basically, uh, as mentioned, is like a, a miles per gallon sticker. The only difference is in miles per gallon, you want the number to be higher. In HERS index, which is right here for this house, for example, is 54, you want it to be lower. In Massachusetts, the code says that any new construction is built today, it should, First, at the building permit level, it should show that this house can obtain, get uh, 55 or below. And at the end, it should show that this house, in fact, was able to perform to 55 or below after all the you know, inspection, testing, et cetera, are done. And then one thing is interesting. So it has all the configuration uh, you know, numbers about the home, et cetera. But one thing also it will uh, show is the estimated annual energy cost um, uh, for this house, for example. Now, something interesting uh, uh, worth mentioning is that uh, in Massachusetts, I think we are about, uh, you know, most people, they use about 50, 70% of their home energy usage. It goes for heating. In these new homes, look at this, it's only 22, what we see about 20 to 25%. It's almost uh, reversed. The equation is reversed for the new homes. And uh, we'll, again, we can talk about this more. Again, um, the HERS index, um, the lower, the better. You can you know, get it, and you try to get it down as low as possible. And then we'll ask Mark to add a little bit of solar and then you can go down to what is called the net zero home energy. And in fact, you can become negative. So you become a generation and you can have a negative Hertz index. Now, again, as many of you may know, uh, you know, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, over 10 years ago, we, uh, we uh, state uh, proposed uh, what's called known as a stretch energy code or stretch code for adoption by communities and every six months, uh, new towns and cities have joined us. And um, so now we have over um, almost 300 or 296 municipalities, they have adopted it. And um, uh, so, so th this is, uh, so that means that these uh, towns, they go a little bit, uh, they basically stretch the energy code and they go a little bit um, higher on the standards and they do a better job. And, you know, gladly, uh, glad to say that Lexington uh, adopted uh, very early on uh, in, uh, I think it was enforced in January of 2011. And in fact, we have been uh, for the past, I think, uh, you know, California used to be number one in terms of energy efficiency. And now for the past nine years, I believe Massachusetts has uh, made the record. I used, uh, so anyway, that's uh, impressive. Now questions, uh, again, uh, any of you may know the answer. Um, uh, question is, it takes more energy to eat up a house than it takes to keep it warm all the time. Um, I usually, we do this uh, in the live uh, audience, so I can, I, I'll just give you the answer. You might know the answer is false. Definitely, um, you know, a number of research has shown that this is not true. It's an old myth, uh, which is inaccurate. It's always when you are, uh, going out of the home, it's always best to turn down your thermostat in the winter time or, or turn, uh, turn it up in the summertime when, you, when nobody is home. And, um, and uh, so, of course, we are in Northeast, so you don't want to make it lower than 55 in winter time, but any degrees that you bring it down, uh, it, it helps a lot. In US, we are spending $18 billion a year in electricity costs from vampire appliances and electronics. So all of us, as you know, we have vampires at our home. And uh, the answer is, 
actually false. It's a, there's a trick question. It's actually $19 billion we are spending on a yearly basis. And, uh, but this is true and it's sad, um, it's happening. So that equivalents about $165 a year per household. We are paying for the things that are essentially we are not using. They are either they're in the um, off mode and they're being, uh, they're sucking the energy or they're in the standby mode and they're sucking the energy. So the last question, wood fireplace can be a good heating source for homes. Exactly. So I see one hand down, Alan, uh, exactly. This is actually, I, I should say that's not a bad heating source uh, for homes. It's a terrible way of uh, heating your home with, uh, with the wood fireplace. I mean, um, yes, you do get some radiation uh, heating when you sit by the wood fireplace and you, that's pleasant, you enjoy it. But what is actually happen, happening because of the, what's called as a, a stack effect, you are basically sucking up all the heat and energy in your home through the chimney out to outside world, which is not desirable. So at least when it's not in use, you have to, you just make sure that those dampers are sealed and preferably you have a airtight of windows or doors in front of your fireplace. Uh, simple, what things we can, simple changes that we can do, um, you know, I always recommend people, homeowners calls us from time to time to have the, you know, energy audit, et cetera, done uh, for their home. We always recommend them to go and uh, take advantage of the, the free energy audit, which is provided by a mass safe program, which is excellent. Actually, we used to do that 10 years ago ourselves. And uh, I think it's uh, foolish not to use it. They, uh, I have a slide about that as well, but Wi-Fi thermostat, I found it very useful, very, uh, it can actually help save energy because of, um, you know, uh, it comes on your iPhone and then it makes it simple. And even if you have forgotten you're overseas on vacation, you can turn the uh, thermostat down. Uh, blinds, uh, vampire power spray. So when, when they come to do the free energy audit for you, they can give you a couple of these smart strip uh, free of charge. So one of them, like this blue one is a control. And that means you put your TV, you plug it in here and, um, and the DVD and all, all other extra uh, uh, devices that are connected to your TV as soon as the remote TV turns it off, these uh, all these green, uh, they go off as well at the same time so you can save energy. These two, they give you a couple of hot one. This, these two remains always hot for the things that you don't wanna turn off. But when, you know, speakers or other stuff that they don't need to be on when the TV is not in use, I think it's a good idea to use one of these smart strips. So again, uh, unplug your charger. Many people think that, uh, you know, if I, uh, my phone is not connected to my phone charger, then uh, it's not uh, using energy, but this is false. It's, it is using energy. It's, uh, you know, it's not much, but it adds up. So um, yeah, make sure you unplug your unused uh, charger. Um, so utility sponsored program, uh, Massive has many different programs. A few of them that we are involved in, uh, we are involved with the new construction low rise program and high rise program. And also uh, just recently they came up with a new program which is called RNA, renovation and addition. And these are very excellent program because not only pays um, for, um, for our costs, I mean, people like us, which can help you to build a better home, more energy efficient, more comfortable, et cetera, it can also um, uh, get you some money as well. So, um, you know, we can potentially get you some money uh, up to $10,000 per unit. And in fact, for the renovation addition projects, the incentives can be much higher than the new construction um, uh, projects. Because in this one, new construction, you're basically competing with other new construction projects 
in renovation and addition, you're essentially competing with your own old home. So the older your own home, your home is potentially, you can make more money. And, uh, but the key thing is that, first of all, the amount of renovation that you're planning to do is more than 500 square foot of the envelope. And then uh, in, uh, the, 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 the also, we need to do an initial inspection before the demo starts. Now, if the demo has started, um, and if you have good photos, maybe uh, we can still put you uh, through the program. But also at the same time, we'll take care of all the paperwork that's necessary, uh, that needed by town uh, to get your building permit and the occupancy, et cetera. So you, um, this is the Mass Save Existing Home Program. They give free energy audit, free LEDs, programmable Wi-Fi, thermostat, et cetera, that you probably all familiar with it. Uh, at the end, I just want to talk about uh, Passive House. This is my favorite uh, um, slides. Uh, again, I don't know, probably you know about Passive House. Uh, essentially, I can simplify it to a hair dryer. This is all the amount of energy. If it's built, uh, designed and built correctly, ideally a passive house home, uh, the amount of energy that you need to heat up a passive house home would be uh, uh, using a hairdryer, about 1500 watt. If you don't believe it, again, I have a two minutes video clip, which, can, uh, which, which I can show you to prove that concept. Uh, why and benefits we wanna do this because of comfort, Safety, yeah, many of the safety issues, you know, with this carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, air quality of the home uh, and I'm um, combustible, et cetera, is all being addressed uh, through our work. Health, air quality is addressed. We can talk about it more, sustainability of the building. Many of the things that happens in the building, I mean, as you know, moisture or water is the number one um, element that can damage your home. So sustainability is on the top uh, of our list when we are working with our clients reducing utility bills of course and resales value those stickers that shows how energy efficient your home uh, home is it's uh, it's becoming more and more uh, uh, you know understandable and more popular and in fact it's going to be added probably soon to the MLS um, helping and of course helping the environment uh, I encourage you guys, if you haven't seen this uh, uh, excellent program from NOVA, the PBS, uh, you might want to uh, take a look at it. Uh, can we call our planet? That, we go to uh, any question. Thank you for listening. Yes, Alan, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have, I have a question and a comment. Um, about the, the chargers, like phone chargers. I always wonder, when if I touch my charger and it is completely cold, room temperature, I just don't feel any heat at all, um, I assume it cannot be drawing very much. Is that right? Yeah, I believe, I don't remember the exact number, of course, depends on the, uh, well, no, I mean, what, what you said is is not true, not necessarily because you cannot feel it with your you know hand, uh, it's not using, it's not sucking energy. No, I mean, uh, I, what I have heard is one to five watt depends on the charger. It can draw electricity, even if nothing is plugged into it. Um, uh, now, let, let, let me forward. add to that, um, Alan, there are some chargers that are made with what's called switching power supplies mm -hmm. and they're dramatically lower loads than ones that have transformers in them. Yeah, the I mean, I felt some that are warm. Yeah, the transformer ones always get warm. The switching power supply ones, I've not put one on a kilowatt in a while, but I, I they, they don't draw anywhere near as much as the transformer-based chargers. Yeah, actually, yeah I should the test transformer that. Transformer ones get warm. I'm reaching over to my, I have a couple plugged into a power strip here, trying to feel them. So these must be switching because they're cold, they're they're room temperature. So yeah, actually, I have a kilowatt. I can easily test and answer my own question. Can yeah. I? The other thing, I just want to make a comment, Bijan, if I could, about Mass Save. And obviously, I've done a Mass Save assessment, and and there's lots of benefits, and they're they're uh, rebased for installation, really generous ones, and there's lots of good stuff. But there's one thing I think we should keep in mind, especially when it comes to questions of their incentives for heating systems, um, is that 
they they will still be recommending uh, upgrading to a more efficient fossil fuel system, mm. which is something that I think really needs to change. And this is not surprising when you remember Mass Save is is kind of a marketing name. The the money actually is all uh, obtained from us, the customers, by the utilities, and is managed by a, a group of people from the utilities with not a lot of oversight. And, and so naturally, they are not especially interested in you stopping using gas or stopping using electricity. So, well, but they've been sort of forced to, to at least try yeah, to get people to be more efficient. To Alan's point, there's been a couple of articles in the Boston Globe as of late looking at Mass Save and this goal that Massachusetts has about a million homes converted to electricity. And we've done what, 538 or something, Alan? Right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You need to do 100,000 a year. You're right on the money, Alan. Uh, absolutely. In fact, this, um, I don't know, it's been probably a year or more than a year that we have been uh, basically, we have a quarterly meeting with utility or through ICF, uh, which is the program coordinator uh, with, the, um, uh, with the utilities. And we have been complaining because of the double standards that they have. So. I'm just uh, talking about the new construction and renovation and addition program uh, and not the existing home program, just that on this side, which I'm very familiar with. So as you know, um, uh, you know, they have started on this pro on this side, they have started incentivizing people for going um, fossil fuel free. So if you're doing new construction or renovation addition, and you are going um, fossil fuel free, they are going to incentivize you. And for the people who are going to use fossil fuel free, we can actually see that the, our model now has changed and they're going to actually penalize you for doing that. So that's a positive side. So, so this is and mass save? This is mass save, the same mass save program, but I, I've let me talk to you about the double standards that is yeah. within the mass save, which is not understandable. And we have been complaining about it for years now. But the other side of this story is that as you may be familiar with it, it's called the equipment rebate program. Now this is another part of the mass, uh, mass save that pays you for if you install like, um, you know, uh, an on-demand, uh, you know, get natural gas boiler or, you know, a furnace, natural gas furnace. In fact, they have bumped up the incentives on those, uh, you know, during the past uh, three years, I, I remember it, they were lower. Right now you can essentially buy, a, for, i just give you an example. You can buy an, uh, uh, basically a boiler for like $2,200 and I think MassSafe gives you, I don't remember now, $2,400 or $2,600 for mm -hmm. it. So you can actually make money for uh, installing a, a gas boiler. Now, what, then what happens is um, what we have seen, now some of our clients, uh, they are finding that is more beneficial for them uh, they, 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 to drop off this program and go with the equipment rebate program uh, in the middle or at the end of the project that we have been working with them. And so basically this is the cannibalization that I call it, I guess, or devil of standards that is, uh, you know, one leg of the mass save is trying to promote to go fossil fuel free. The other one is still pushing it very, um, you know, so. I'm uh, glad uh, to hear about the fossil fuel fee part. Is that, is that in their future? You know, they, they operate with three-year uh, planning cycles. I wonder if that's in the next three-year planning cycle, which is being finalized now. No, I, yeah, no, it's already. In it's already effect. out there? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, hmm. But as I said, uh, you know, until this equipment rebate program still exists, um, this is hurting this program, this new program that is still, uh, is now active on this side. So they're kind of fighting with each other. How, how do you spell the qubit? You say qubit rebate? Say that again, sorry. How do you spell, what's the name? It's the qubit rebate? What's the first word? Oh, um, so what, equipment, uh, uh, sorry, equipment rebate program. You, so, you know, for the for the mechanicals that you buy. Oh, e for, equipment? Equipment, right. Oh, I'm okay. not pronouncing sorry. it well, sorry. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. Gotcha. Uh, 
so yeah, for for the AC units, for the boilers, on-demand right. water heaters, uh, furnaces, etc., you can you can file. You know, once you buy buy it, you can fill in the application and send it to utility, right. and you get your rebate back in the mail. Sure. The the program that I'm talking about, basically, our model basically calculates everything based on the kilowatt hour saving and the B2R saving that you have done after your project is finished. Right. Whether in the new construction program, they compare you with other, you know, the, the reference, the, the baseline, and with the RNA, they compare you with your own home to see how well you have done. And based on that kilowatt hour saving and B2R savings, then they uh, that translates to money. Uh, so at the end of each project, when we send the final certificate, we tell these clients, okay, you're getting $5,632.33. And that's the check they're gonna receive at the end. I mean, uh, after two to three months, they will receive a check in the mail. Thank you. Okay. All right, you're welcome. Um, I wanted to answer a question that I think it was Rebecca Tightmore asked. Are you still there, Rebecca? It has to do with uh, what's happened to generation this year versus last year as far as rain goes. While Bijan was doing his presentation, I dug into four systems. And of the four systems, one was down from, from last year to from so from January 1st to September 23rd last year versus this year. So one of the systems I looked at, production was down 7%. 7.5%, another one was 7.8%, another one was down 5.6%, and another one was down 6.7%. So these are, these are all similar technology sites. They all went live about the same time. And they've all showed uh, this year, so there were seven, five to 7% lower production than last year. And I would directly attribute that to rain and cloudy weather because we had a very light snow winter this year, so. So yeah, rain affects production. <laughs> Clouds affect production. I think we'll do about um, 10 more minutes of questions and then um, we'll let everyone go for the evening. So if anyone- Oh, and then I wanted to build on something Bijan said about the vampires and the things that use electricity. Uh, we had a TiVo for many, many years. You know, that's the thing that records TV and allows you to watch TV right. delayed and. Um, I measured it with my kilowatt and it turns out it was 35 watts, 35 watts. And that TiVo ran all the time. So 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I live in Hudson. Electricity here is 11 cents kilowatt hour. So it's the cheapest or second cheapest in the state. And it cost me $35 a year to run my TiVo. What do you think it costs for you guys in Eversource to run that same TiVo? $76 a year in electricity to keep to be able to watch your TV shows. So they add up, particularly those things that are 30, you know, 30 watts and 40 watts and 50 watts. That's real yeah. money when you start adding it up. So that's how we get to the 19 billion number that, that Bijan provided. I, I bet that the Verizon set-top box that does that kind of recording thing is using more than yours because boy, it is, it is toasting up there. But yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Put your kilowatt on it and watch. Yeah. I have. I just you'll, you'll suddenly hate television if you don't already hate it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So all of us, I guess, we can do little things here and there. Um, um, yeah, and it can help. Well, yeah. It's since you say that, I'm, there's always this issue about what do we do there. I think it's important that we do things individually, like we're talking about here with our homes. And but I think it, there's also you know there's all levels. There's local government. There's state government, there's national government, there's international policies, and and it, it needs to be. It seems like everything's got to be on deck. You know, there there are arguments for all of these different levels. Absolutely, absolutely, and in fact, what we have seen. I mean, as I said, Massachusetts. I mean, as a state, we have been great uh, comparing to the rest of the nation. I mean. Uh, again, California, uh, you know, and Massachusetts have been over time and time in you know, going, but we are, we are, as far as code is concerned, and as far as energy code is concerned, I think we are doing great. As, the, as far as the incentive programs that are available to us, I think we are doing great. We can do better. Uh, however, as far as uh, code implementation, um, you know, or enforcement, code enforcement, 
I'm, I'm not so sure. Still, uh, unfortunately, we see from town to town and cities and cities, we see wide variety of different uh, enforcement. And th that, is, um, that, th that is something I think that we should be working uh, more on and uh, perhaps um, bring the, you know, bring it to the, I guess, uh, public meetings of BBRS or if we have connections at the higher level to do something about it. Okay. Other questions? Great. Maybe we're worn out. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a very informative presentation. There were definitely lots of questions and I'm sure um, there might be some more that come up so people can feel free to reach out to myself or Mark or Bijan if you have any other questions after you have time to let this information marinate and look into uh, what next steps you might be able to take for your own um, home energy efficiency. Speaking of um, different levels, Stella is a sustainability manager for Lexington, I believe. And um, I'm, I'm from Winchester and we just, we just hired somebody who's gonna begin in that position. So that's, a, I think that's a really important thing in, in, for all of these levels, well, that's, that's a, locally, that's an important role, I think. I look forward to being in contact with you some more. Thank in, you. In neighboring town. Yes, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Thanks, Stella. Thank you, Stella. Good evening, everyone. And as I mentioned, the recording will be available um, at a, a date soon, so you can rewatch. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.